Hello, I'm Mike Baselli, your host for this podcast and the global community that has rallied around it. Before the coronavirus outbreak, I had a touching conversation with a precision medicine expert and executive who is dedicating her life's work to bring relief to our community members living with cancer and to empower their healthcare providers. Rebecca Owens is the president of Taproot Health, a fast growth company that has developed the necessary infrastructure to collect and share high quality patient consented data to provide precision care to cancer patients. While spending time together, Rebecca shared when she told her mother that she would dedicate her career to cancer and the many reasons she is deeply committed to moving the disease towards a cure. We also discussed why she and her co-founder at Taproot Health were able to form their business partnership quickly, which led to the launch of their company. Additionally, Rebecca outlined where she sees the field of precision cancer medicine is heading and why Taproot Health is well positioned to help lead this transformative area of healthcare. I'm excited for you to get to know Rebecca and to find ways to be a part of the movement she is creating with her life's work. Because of leaders like Rebecca, I remain confidently optimistic that we will eliminate cancer for our communities across the world. Welcome to Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli, where we highlight and speak with the innovators, the game changers, and the pioneers who are deeply passionate and relentless in solving the problems our world is facing today. This is your opportunity to connect with and learn from these leaders and to support them on their mission. Perhaps they will soon be hearing your story as well. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Vaselli. I look forward to having you on this journey with us. Rebecca, welcome to our podcast being recorded at Halo Creative Labs located inside of Angel MD's headquarters here at Catalyst, our healthcare innovation campus in downtown Denver. Thank you, Mike, for having me. It is fantastic to speak with you today. I'm honored to spend time with you today, Rebecca, as you and the team at Taproot Health are working on two key areas I'm very passionate about, finding a cure for cancer and data. I'm particularly excited to share all the things happening at Taproot Health's Data as a Service Enterprise that is uniting all oncology stakeholders in launching a transparent data marketplace and what that means for our nation. But before we dive into your vision and mission in moving cancer towards a cure, a bit of housekeeping. For our audience, while listening to any of our episodes, please make sure to join our online community at passionatepioneers.com in order to share feedback and ideas with our guests and interact with the entire community. And lastly, please take a moment to nominate other Passionate Pioneers for a future episode via our guest nomination form link, as well as subscribe to the podcast so you will automatically receive episode updates in your podcast player. Simply search Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli on iTunes or Spotify, or click the link at the bottom of the episode notes. All right, Rebecca, we have one more item to cover before discussing all things cancer and data. Let's take a moment to break the ice a bit so our community can get to know you. I'm going to randomly select one of three questions here. We're going to talk food. Favorite meal and why? Oh, my goodness. That's a tough one, but I could tell you that I could eat Thai food every single day if I could. And I would say the reason why I like Thai food is the complexities of it. You can have, you know, sweet and spicy and tangy, and it just kind of encompasses every kind of flavor that you possibly can, that your tongue can experience. So I would say that it would be Thai food for sure. I knew I liked you, Rebecca. I love Thai food. Matter of fact, last year, I spent a good amount of time over in Thailand. Holy cow, was uh, my mouth on fire in good ways. I, I love <laughs> spicy food. And having it in Thailand was incredible. I'm envious. It was so good. What's your favorite dish? Are you a pad thai? What, what, uh, what's your favorite dish? I like tom kha gai, the chicken soup. And that is probably something I literally could eat every day. Well, I'm a big fan of Thai food. So you and I will get along swimmingly well when we go out and eat at a restaurant. So Thai food it is. Thank you for sharing that, Rebecca. I do appreciate it. Let's go and take it back a bit. We have so much to discuss on all the things happening at Taproot Health, the incredible mission and journey and and movement that all of you are creating at the organization. But before we go there, let's take it back a bit. 
one just doesn't create this data as a service enterprise. How did you get to where you are today? I know you're also a former college athlete and swimmer at UCLA. We were both there during the Pac-10 days, but maybe take us back a bit after you got done swimming and, and studying at UCLA. How did you get to where you are today? You know, there's nothing that happens without a reason. And I can tell you, I'll take you back to when I was 10 years old and I told my mother that I was going to be involved in cancer AIDS. And here I came out of school with a sociology degree, clearly no med school or anything in sight. However, coming right out of college as an athlete where I couldn't work because I was a full scholarship athlete, I applied to about 50 companies and ended up at a company where we sold antibodies for cancer detection. And that in itself was fascinating. And I really latched on to the science behind cancer detection. And it started to propel me forward in, you know, thinking about how to better diagnose patients who were being diagnosed as cancer and what did that mean and how were physicians using this test, whether it be performed in the laboratory or how did it translate to the clinic and diagnosis. And here I was, 23 years old, educating physicians on how to do better cancer diagnostic testing. And there was a complete breakdown in this. And I thought, man, I could really help physicians detect cancer better as well as treat patients more efficiently and help oncologists better understand how to interpret those diagnostic tests. And there's a huge information gap between the two. And so the last 20 years, really, that's what I've been looking at, how to educate physicians on how to better run and utilize testing and furthermore treat these patients. And what did that look like in regards to some of the organizations, like in practicality? What were some of the organizations that were working on this? What did that look like in the marketplace? How did that act as and interact as, as businesses in the industry at large? Yeah, great question. So I was in the commercial laboratory space initially, and those companies, you know, went all the way back to people like Empath, Genzyme Genetics, Clarion, who was purchased by GE Healthcare, and then onward to a company called Foundation Medicine, who recently was acquired by Roche Pharmaceuticals. And I, you know, really advanced my career from, I would say, selling commercial laboratory testing, biomarker testing, and on to looking at the data that was being, you know, generated underneath all of these different tests. And then the data that was then also being transferred and, you know, for treatment decisions in the clinic. And through that experience, Rebecca, when was the aha moment for Taproot Health? The aha moment for Taproot Health was about four years ago when my business partner, Dr. Dane Dixon, and I met at a very large oncology conference called ASCO. And we came together, you know, talking about cancer data and advancement of, at that point in time, next generation sequencing for identifying targetable, you know, alterations that had therapeutic implications. And at that point in time, next generation sequencing, DNA sequencing was not approved by Medicare. And Dr. Dixon was working on an initiative within Medicare, and then he left and started a nonprofit to collect data to help laboratories get their diagnostic tests for next generation sequencing approved. And I was working on how to bring data together, meaning genomic sequencing data and outcome data, while I was leading an initiative at Foundation Medicine called the Precision Medicine Exchange Consortium, PMEC. And we were looking at this from two different angles, but realized that our ideas were very much aligned in how and why you would need to bring such complex data together to advance research. And so I left Foundation Medicine and joined Dr. Dixon. And for the last four years, we've really been focusing on what is it going to take to really advance this field and bring this data together. So... First, it was a nonprofit. We sunset the nonprofit. Then we went on to found Taproot Health about 18 months ago. Before we dive into Taproot Health, can you maybe give us a little bit more of an understanding of the complexities here? What are the problems that are holding us back? Why is it? Why are these problems so persistent? Can you maybe give us a little bit of understanding from an expert's view what this means for all of us as laypeople? 
Yeah, there's there's a vast, uh, I would say, array of problems. But as we really think about the problems and what we focus on is, you know, bringing key stakeholders together and everybody in healthcare, I would say, has their unique focus and their initiatives and what they're doing. For example, at the academic cancer institutions, you know, the NCI cancer institutions, you know, they really focus on uh, research and generating grants and advancing science through their own initiatives, but they only have a limited set of patients that they might be able to access within their own community. For example, in San Diego, they're going to see San Diego patients. And while some patients may travel to their expertise, they're still going to have a very limited set of patients. And so while they're focused on generating research within their own institution, they have limited patients and then they have limited studies and limited patients for those studies. And so the research doesn't advance as quickly. Then you have the community setting where the community practices are extremely busy and they're just working on trying to take care of their day-to-day patients. They may not be doing as much research as the academic setting. And you've got about 80% of cancer patients that are in the community. So you can imagine the larger cohorts of patients are in the community setting, not being necessarily studied or advancing to clinical trials and to research. And then you've got the limited patient sets in academia. And so, you know, the way we look at it is how do you bridge the community, you know, patients and clinicians with the academic patients and clinicians? And how do we create a model where people are free and willing to share that data? And I'm imagining, you know, any entrepreneur uh, that wants to start a company just like yours, they're going to go out and stress test those ideas in the marketplace. When you had these ideas, when you started talking to the stakeholders, what were some of those initial comments back to you? Like, oh my gosh, you guys are onto something big or no, it doesn't quite make sense. What were some of those initial reactions in the marketplace with your vision? Yeah, that is, again, you know, what you would expect is, yeah, good luck. That's a huge risk and nobody's going to (laughs) participate. Right. (laughs) Everybody is trying to figure out how to bring people together and, you know, but we need it, you know, and no, every turn we took to decide, do we just go back to our day jobs and forget this idea? Every turn we took, we talked to pharmaceutical companies, we talked to manufacturing companies, we talked to, you know, our primary investigators or principal investigators at the academic sites that we were working with in the nonprofit, you know, we went to every single one of them and we said, you know, if we could find the right model to support this type of initiative, do you think people would participate? And the answer was undoubtedly yes, just good luck finding the right model and being able to pull it all together. But everybody hands down said, we absolutely need a central database with genomic biomarker data and patient outcome, longitudinal patient outcome data. So then, of course, it begs the next question and then we'll dive into it. Why hasn't it been done before? I know you mentioned, yeah, it's difficult, but truly, why hasn't it been done before? You know, there's, we talk about this quite a bit internally, Dr. Dixon and I, and, you know, there's great science, right? There's great technology. There's, you know, all these advancements in therapeutics and there's tons of money and there's, you know, there's no reason why this couldn't have been done before. And I'd say there's been versions, what we would call like oncology data 2.0. There's been versions of this prior to this. I think that, you know, our deep knowledge and in, in one understanding clinical oncology, which Dr. Dixon is a community-based practicing oncologist. And then my experience in biomarker data in itself, not just the testing, but how the data looks and being able to figure out a framework first and foremost where this data can actually reside together is fairly forward thinking because we have today different systems. For example, we have laboratory, you know, systems, we have radiology systems, then we have the EMRs and, you know, there are variations of data that sit in each of these that are very important for the individual patient case. So our deep knowledge and I think both of those and bringing our our knowledge together is first and foremost, you know, important. And then number two is our willingness and our passion really to bring this together. You know, it is a huge risk. We, We know it is a large undertaking to do this, but we are both completely convinced that there is no way that we will speed up research and bringing, you know, novel testing and novel drugs 
to patients quicker if we don't do this. Well, let's talk about the doing this part. I want to tee it up with a quote from Dr. Dixon in a recent news publication. He states, quote, we will all work together to further build and expand data collection and sharing efforts to create a sustainable system that will allow researchers access to patient consented high quality data tied to prospectively obtained patient outcomes. Obviously, you and your executive team are confident this will be transformative in the world of precision medicine and where cancer treatment is tailored to an individual patient. Rebecca, this is incredibly exciting. So let's start diving in. What is Taproot Health? How are you building this? What's been the reception now in the marketplace now that you've been after it for a bit? But let's start with what is Taproot Health? Taproot Health is a data as a service oncology platform. And in that platform, it is a network of physicians who have agreed and decided to come together to consent patients scientifically adhere to a clinical trial protocol, which is an observational one, which you stated in that quote is prospective. So it's prospective data and a business model where when under the patient consent, we are able to license out any of the data that we have spent a lot of time aggregating alongside the physicians. When that data gets licensed out to pharmaceutical companies, manufacturing companies, any kind of research, or let's say a data or AI company, and they're trying to build, you know, sophisticated AI tools for understanding, you know, patient outcomes or whatever that might be, that that when that data gets licensed, any dollars that come back from those licenses gets disseminated amongst those data contributors who have spent time and time and time following these patients. And so that is really the entire model. It is a physician network. It is a scientific derived clinical data and platform that matches that trial. And it is a business model that supports the aggregation and advancement of research data. I absolutely love this. And we do have some real, real smart engineers that listen in and are part of this community. Can you maybe go down in the weeds a bit? How do you actually pull this off? So that is also great. You know, there's, I I love this recent article that came out from the CEO of Novartis. And he is extremely innovative and loves technology. And he just did this 2019 kind of summary of what his thinking was when he took this role and looking at all these great tools like AI and natural language processing. And, you know, he said even big data is fantasized. You know, it's it's real or fetishized. That was the word he used. And so for us, there is the meeting the physician at the point of care. So there is understanding workflow, which sometimes that might not be this greatest advanced technology. Uh, However, there are pieces of our workflow that fit right into the way a physician practices, both in the academic setting and the community, which they are vastly different. And then the framework that supports us is fairly unique in the engineering that it also fits to the workflow of whether it be an oncologist or radiologist and how they interact with data. And then the patient consent pieces are extremely unique. We are GDPR compliant, as well as some of the uh, federal regulations that we face here in the United States. We use some blockchain and blockchain-like, and I say blockchain-like because it is an audit trail that we can see who's touching the data, when, how, how did they analyze it, what did they analyze, at what time, where are they located, et cetera. You get the point that the framework monitors all of those interactions with that data, which is very critical when we talk about managing patient consent and we talk about how we control that data going forward. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that, Rebecca. So I want to turn a little bit to some of these cornerstone centers that have signed on with Taproot Health and to be a part of this movement. Because I can tell you, Rebecca, you know this as all as I do, being a multiple time over founder. It is hard to start from zero, start from scratch and create a movement that is bringing in national leading, international leading names that are some of these cornerstone centers. Can you talk a little bit about some of those centers why they got behind you in the early days, why do they want to be a part of this, and what has this meant to them already? 
Yeah, that's a a wonderful question. First of all, coming out of the gate, only working on Taproot Health itself for 18 months, it speaks volumes that we have built the right model, that the three NCI Cancer Institutes, the Knight Cancer Institute at OHSU, Oregon Health Science University, um, the Moore's Cancer Center at UCSD, in San Diego. You also have Thomas Jefferson University, Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And you just look at those three alone, they are very leading in cancer research. And when we think about the fact that they have come on to Taproot and said, we back this, it tells us that we have the right model. And then at the community level, you've got two regional practices. And what we're trying to demonstrate is that you can bring academia and community-based oncologists together where they feel comfortable in sharing data to advance research. And the reason that they've chosen to be a part of this is also that they understand that their patient population is fairly limited. And it is going to take, if we're going to get to personalized medicine, beyond precision medicine that is going to take larger cohorts of patients than any one group can deal with alone or that they're going to see in their own community. So they enrich each other's data sets by identifying, you know, while OHSU, Night Cancer Center might have, let's say, 10 lung cancer patients with certain genomic alterations that are being studied on the pharmaceutical side for, you know, targeted therapies or even a personalized medicine, It's 10 patients, and the FDA is never going to pass a protocol or a treatment based on 10 patients. But if you match that up with Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center and their lung cancer patients who also have the same alterations, and then you also add UCSD Moore's Cancer Center, you know, and the community practices, well, now maybe all of a sudden you've gotten to over 100 or 200 patients with the same genomic alterations that can be studied by a pharmaceutical company with a targeted therapy or a personalized treatment. Wow. That is exciting. You know, it speaks to exactly what I get excited about and creating community, creating togetherness. If we're going to really solve some of these big issues and problems in our communities across the world. But, you know, one thing, and I'll just call it out like it is. And what I've seen through my journey and my experience in healthcare is there is and has been a lot of parochialism, a lot of, uh, you know, I'm not going to share Are you seeing some of those barriers being broken down through the movement that Taproot Health is creating? I've seen it as well, Mike, and I think that's also what's fueled me personally. You know, when I have seen that patient data, you know, I I have family members and friends who've been diagnosed with cancer and very difficult ones. You know, I lost my uncle within two months to pancreatic cancer. Both of my parents have had cancer, and it is just upsetting to hear that their data is not being shared. And I mean, pieces of data. When we talk about DNA and genomics, these scientific advancements that we're seeing both in research as well as in community practice, clinical practice, is that, you know, this is a very important data that needs to be matched up. And so I think that, you know, at the, at the academic setting, you know, everybody is, wants to advance research. Everybody wants to see this disease brought to a cure. So there's, there's no doubt that, that everybody has very similar motivations. Where I think it falls down is that they don't have maybe the time or the resources or the capabilities to really bring these types of initiatives together like what we're doing at Taproot Health. You know, we have, we've built a modular, flexible, innovative framework that might take an academic center a a very long time to get to. And we're more nimble and we can, we don't have some of the same constraints, even though we're going to have to get through legal contracting. But we have the flexibility ability really to understand and build a solution that can bring community physicians together with academia. And I I really do think it is, you know, this is the right, you know, innovative model to do that. Well, I'm all about it. And this is uh, right up my alley as well. I'm definitely going to continue to root this on because this work is needed now more than ever. You know, Rebecca, let's kind of uh, pivot a little bit in kind of future state. Let's also talk about where you're going to see or where you're seeing the industry going at large. But before we do that, 
Take us through a little bit where you're seeing Taproot Health in the next one to three years, three to five years. Are you going to go international? What is the future state of this platform, of this enterprise, this organization look in the next coming years? Yeah, that's again, great question. And, you know, we, we've we really been very strategic in our approach. And, you know, while we only have five sites you know, initially, we are looking to expand here very quickly to a maximum of 10 that we believe that we can onboard and scale. But beyond that, you know, in the next two years, we're looking at a rapid scale. And I would say a rapid scale, maybe within the next 18 months to two years, where we can open this up broadly across the U.S., You know, the clinical trial is already on clinicaltrial.gov. However, we are not enrolling quite yet because we want to make sure that we can compliantly enroll patients, that the physicians are working with the system accurately, that we can do the best training, you know, all the scaling things that we need to focus on and why we're limiting it just to the few right now. And Dr. Dix and I have spent a lot of time talking about national versus international. You know, you have different data laws in other countries like China, again, being different than Europe. While we're GDPR compliant today, you know, we still have different contractual obligations and compliance obligations in other countries that would take us a lot more time and resources, especially when you start talking about clinical trials and observational studies of patients as well as their data. So we have committed ourselves to focusing on the United States at this point in time. And then as we evolve and have the scale, we will then start to roll it out to international and probably strategically roll it out internationally to those countries that, you know, have the same philosophies that we do and we can adhere to within our framework. Thank you for sharing that, Rebecca, and looking forward to that future state for the company. But let's also talk future state about the industry at large. You're obviously a thought leader. You're definitely, you know, having a leadership positioning and moving us forward towards these new realities. This term precision medicine, right? I think a lot of people are still trying to figure out what the heck does that even mean from a layperson mm-hmm. perspective. Where do you see precision medicine in the next kind of one to three, three to five years as well? What does this mean for all of us? Yeah, you know, if it were up to me, I'd love to say that we could get to personalized medicine like tomorrow. You know, we know that each person is is a bit different and there's a lot of contributing factors to, you know, DNA, to how we metabolize drugs, to, you know, proteomics, to who knows, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes on each individual patient. So, you know, precision medicine, as we talk about precision medicine today, you know, I I would say that precision medicine still is not a complete realization. We haven't completely realized the advantages or even gotten to the place where we are broadly accepting precision medicine. So if we just take today and even these next three to five years as Taproot Health, and we would really like to see precision medicine become a reality so that we can get to personalized medicine. And when I say that, that means that, you know, patients are being tested, biomarker tested, whether it be genomic sequencing. Today, people would be shocked to believe or understand that 40% of cancer patients today who qualify for biomarker testing, next generation sequencing testing, are still not being tested today. That is really bad. And we will not be able to treat these patients with these targeted therapies without those biomarker tests being run. Number two is we have only, I would say, less than the statistics are less than 4% of patients are going on clinical trial. Well, those go hand in hand, right? You, if you're not testing the patients and understanding what, what targets or what genomics are going on with that patient or what are we even talking about, you know, from a deeper, deeper level of understanding biologically of that patient, then I don't even know where they would qualify potentially for a clinical trial other than if I just called it breast cancer, if I just call it colon cancer and stage three, stage four, whatever that might be, without really understanding what's biologically gi- driving that patient's cancer. So less than 4% of patients on trial, we can only understand that then that contributes to the 10, you know, plus years that it takes to get a single drug to market. So extremely costly, too much time. We still have six or 600,000, you know, people dying of cancer in the United States today. And, you know, we, we are not even utilizing the testing that is available for these patients. So at Taproot, you know, in our next three to five years, it is really focusing on getting these patients tested, 
more efficiently identifying them for trials and speeding up the progress of novel testing and novel drugs to market, which at a rate right now is a seven to 10 plus years for either test or drug to market that we would love to see that these get to market in less than, you know, somewhere between three to five years. And if we can have that impact and begin to actualize that, then maybe we can start talking about personalized treatments. That is very encouraging. And I can hear the passion, obviously, through this call, that there is no doubt in my mind that you're going to continue to help push us towards that. So thank you for sharing that as well, Rebecca. Now let's kind of turn it on its head a bit. Uh, You shared some really exciting vision and mission at Taproot Health, but let's also get the community involved that has rallied around this podcast. What is one problem, need, or question that you or Taproot have Health have at this current time that the community can be contemplating and helping you with? Man, there's just so much that, you know, we need to get behind this. And this is not an inexpensive effort. I mean, we are talking about a very heavy lift. And I say heavy lift in the way of, you know, just encouraging physician participation, you know, helping them understand that the data that we are needing to collect and follow patients is extremely valuable to those individual patients as well as the future patients that will be facing cancer. And so it's really how do we engage these these physicians? How do we engage sites more quickly? And while we're doing that, we need to raise some capital and fund this initiative for a much broader scale beyond our five sites. And even with our five sites, we're going to have to raise some capital to support this. And we've today, just so just to add to that, today we are solely funded by ourselves. So we have not sought out any outside investors. And for the reason being is that we know that we want the right partners who can get behind this, who see the same problems, who really want to advance cancer and, and say this is the right way to do it just like we believe. So alert to the venture capital and private equity leaders out there that are also wildly passionate about pushing this vision and mission forward please do take a moment to head over to passionatepioneers.com and and comment and leave some notes for Rebecca and her team, as I know she'll be and her team will be excited to hear from you. So thank you for sharing that, Rebecca. And I'm sure we'll be having some folks calling and writing in very shortly here as well. Well, let's also talk about where some of those leaders and others can get a hold of all of you online. Where are some uh, contact points online, whether it be websites, social media handles or otherwise? Yep, we can be found at www.taprootco, that's T-A-P-R-O-O-T-C-O dot com. I can also be reached at Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A dot Owens, O-W-E-N-S at taprootco.com. Or they can reach us at info at taprootco dot com. And we will leave all those contact points in Rebecca's article found inside of passionatepioneers.com as well. So, and those will be included in the episode notes for this podcast episode as well. So thank you for sharing that, Rebecca. And it is now time to take us home. We have a fill in the blank for you. One of my favorite parts of this podcast. Uh, Please fill this in. I'm a passionate pioneer because? I'm a passionate pioneer because my purpose is to change the face of cancer. Very well said. Thank you for that, Rebecca. And thank you for everything that you and the team at Taproot Health are doing, the mission and the vision that you're pushing forward for so many of us around this country and soon around the world. We applaud your efforts. We look forward to continuing to follow the journey. Thank you for spending time with our community today. Thank you, Mike. This has been truly a wonderful conversation, and I am very excited to have been able to take part in Passionate Pioneers. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. We'd love to hear your feedback about the podcast so we can continue to improve this community and to further support the pioneers being featured. Lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and invite your friends and colleagues to join us. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you back with us during our next episode. 